Hello, welcome to uh, Crops TV. I'm Lee Burris. I'm a professor in the Department of Agronomy here at Iowa State University, and I'm delighted to be here speaking about CSR2. This is just a refresher on uh, when and where CSR2 will work best. Before I even get into that discussion, though, um, I want to uh, thank Brent, thank everyone in Extension for um, having me speak. And I need to acknowledge a bunch of people, beginning with Brent, going in Mark Licht, you know, our outstanding uh, colleague in agronomy, and then especially Tom Fitton, Aaron Sassman, uh, uh, Jerry Miller, uh, and Aaron Sassman, who've all had a lot to uh, go on with making uh, CSR2 work well like it is now. Actually, Dr. Fenton and Dr. Miller, I'll be mentioning a few more times. There's a lot of other people, both at Iowa State and with NRCS, I could acknowledge as well. Uh, they've done a tremendous amount of uh, work to, to, in the backgrounds to make CSR2 work right. Before I present, though, about CSR2 itself, though, uh, I always like to tell any group I'm working with, uh, there are some key search terms that are really helpful. So as you're listening to this, as you're watching this, as you're thinking about uh, soils in general, soil productivity, I always want to uh, put in a plug for Web Soil Survey. That's an amazingly uh, powerful uh, tool uh, made available through NRCS that will tell us a lot about our soil map. So if you look up a Web Soil Survey, you can look up uh, for free, your tax dollars have already paid for it, uh, a beautiful soil map of, of your place. Uh, likewise, if you look up ISU Land Use, that's a Jerry Miller webpage. Uh, even though Dr. Miller is retired, that's a really nice webpage to look up. If you want the more modern version of it, uh, look up Bradley Miller's ISU Soil Geospatial Laboratory. Dr. M uh, Miller is doing a great job of updating all this information in, in really exciting ways, very powerful ways that we'll use a lot over the 21st century. You'll use a lot over the 21st century. Iowa Ortho GIS is a nice place to go to uh, simply because it will um, give you some air photos of your property uh, that will um, even give you historical photos. You can go back and find uh, how your land use looked like uh, from the air in 1939, 1950, 1960. Really nice. It may be odd that I have University of California Davis soil survey listed there, but if you type in those words, what you'll find is that they will... Um, have an app that you can download to your smartphone of all this information up above, the web soil survey information especially. And so that means when a friend of yours is driving you uh, across South Dakota on the interstate at 80 miles an hour, which is legal, instead of you being bored having to listen to him or her drone on and on and on, you can instead just uh, look up and see exactly what soils you're driving over because that app is so fast, it will give you web soil survey information at 80 miles an hour. Uh, I put in Google Earth because they have all the soil survey information now tied into Google Earth as well. The California webpage can let you tie it into Google Earth. So then you can pick different air photo backgrounds that you want. And then uh, NRCS, NCCPI, a lot of initials, that's just uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, so USDA. But NCCPI stands for the uh, National Commodity Crop Productivity Index. It's the uh, CSR2 but applied to the whole United States. They do it a little differently. The numbers don't come out the same. Uh, they would make Iowa fit into two or three categories, so they're not near as specific for Iowa uh, as, uh, as we need across the state. Now, in terms of actually for the next 45 minutes or so as I'm speaking, uh, our goal over the next 45 minutes is just to understand the role soil has in crop productivity, followed by recognizing the value and limitations of CSR2. Uh, the topics, I'm going to start with Iowa. Uh, I'm going to speak about Iowa as a guy who deals with uh, uh, soils. So, so it won't be about the history of Iowa and all sorts of things. Just a little bit about how I think about soils and Iowa and how those go together. Uh, just like to point out, I don't know much about yield, land value, or profit, but I'll mention that again in a couple minutes. And then the main, main gist of our presentation is clearly soil productivity and CSR2. And then I'll summarize it. Uh, you can't read it in yellow very well, but I always point out I'm really comfortable with discussion. So I'll just put in a plug uh, right now that if you have questions, concerns about this, something going on, give me a call, send me a note, probably better yet, at Iowa State, send me an email, and I'll try to respond to it and try, try to help you out. So in terms of Iowa and soil, I want to point out that most of the world, and certainly those of us in Iowa, we're deeply proud of our soils. We have, and we do. We should be. We have incredible soils. 
And, and that was even recognized back in 1870 with this quote from an extension, excuse me, not an extension, an immigration bulletin where we were trying to get uh, folks to come from England or Germany or, or the Netherlands or Sweden, uh, so across Scandinavia, to uh, immigrate into Iowa. And it worked well. And, and basically it just says, we have the best soils in the world. And, and I'm, I'm really proud of that. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with what I do, uh, but I benefit from it in my work. More specifically in Iowa, when I think of our state, uh, Iowa is 36 million acres, so 56,000 square miles, but since uh, this is an agronomic presentation, 36 million acres and it's 91% farms. To say it a little bit differently, whenever I think about Iowa, uh, what I always think of is we are the most privately owned state in the United States. Percentage-wise, we don't have public lands. Percentage-wise, we don't have wild lands, we don't have rivers, we don't have anything we have farmlands. Uh, and on that farm this past year, uh, corn and soybean crop was worth conservatively about $25 billion. So that's the uh, farm gate value for um, corn and soybeans. The cropland, if we were to sell all 33 million acres of farmland we have in Iowa uh, and all sold for the average price, it would be worth about uh, $300 billion. And in case you're curious, there's normally I find about 10 to one to 12 to one ratio between the commodity crop value we sell in Iowa and what the total state's cropland is worth. Uh, we grow that corn on about 14 million acres. Some years it's down to 13 million acres. Some years it's up to 15 million acres or so. And currently we're getting over 200 bushels per acre, but for sort of a running total, running average for the last few years, I would say about 200 bushels per acre. Uh, the soybean we grow on about 10 million acres uh, and our average yield uh, these days is about 60 bushels per acre. But of course, as we all realize, we're not growing those corn or soybeans just to grow corn or soybeans. We grow them, uh, we grow those crops because we sell them. We make them value-added products. The map on the left is showing in green where across the United States we grow uh, corn and soybeans, corn in that map. Uh, but the little dots are where we have ethanol plants or soy diesel plants. So we're really growing those corn and uh, soybeans, these uh, trillions of bushels of commodities we produce, we're, uh, we're growing those in order to make a lot of biofuels. And then the slide on the lower right, uh, excuse me, the photo on the slower, lower right is simply reminding us we're growing all those crops in order to uh, produce a lot of livestock. And I think at the moment in Iowa, we have almost about 30 million pigs uh, alive, which means over a year, we have 60 million pigs anymore we produce uh, a year. And um, just to give you my prediction, uh, I, I bet in 20 years, instead of 60 million pigs, we're producing about 100 million pigs. And of course, uh, 40 years ago, we produced about 25 million pigs. So to put that into human terms, the state of Iowa's population, we stay at 3 million people. 40 years ago, we were at 3 million people. Right now, we're at 3 million people. Uh, 40 years from now, we're expected to be at 3 million people. So our population is constant, even though the United States as a whole is gaining people. Our pig population, our chicken population, our livestock population just keeps skyrocketing. So that's really why we grow the corn and soybeans, though, because we sell those crops for higher values to other people. Or even internally, we convert them into animal uh, uh, protein, as, as it's said sometimes in the, in the other world. Uh, and our goal as a state here in Iowa is to always have in continuously increasing yields. Uh, I always point out, some of you have probably heard me say this, uh, Iowa is a place where our governor knows what our corn yields are, what our soybean yields are. Our governor is always interested in that because the state of Iowa's economy depends on more corn being produced, more soybeans being produced, and they them being sold for a higher value constantly. So without a doubt, agronomically speaking, our goal is always increasing yields. And of course, yield, in my world, yield comes down to three things. Yield comes down to what the weather is. Um, and so a couple of slides ago where I had the long-term trends in corn yields, long-term trends in soybean yields, we see all the year-to-year -year variability. Well, of course, most of us would explain that by weather. A bad weather year, yield plummets. A perfect weather year, yield skyrockets. So. Our yield is a function of weather. It's also very much a function of management. And under management, I put things like tile drainage, 
Uh, if we were to irrigate, I would put that under management. Uh, we add fertilizer, so nutrients. We do tillage of one type or another. Uh, we manage to make sure toxins aren't a problem, so we keep the pH right, so we manage pH, uh, all those sorts of things. Uh, in terms of climate, we manage uh, the soil climate and really the microclimate of the field through residue and tillage, wind breaks, irrigation can actually change the soil temperature as well. And certainly we manage the biology of the system through improved genetics, through uh, reducing co competition, uh, so pest suppression, so herbicides, anything like that. Uh, and then we also even manage biology through having uh, microorganisms in the system. So we have uh, inoculant on all of our soybeans. And then we also manage um, uh, our fields by exactly how our row spacings work, our seed densities, all these things to try to optimize yield. So to me, weather is huge about understanding yield. Management, which I, as you can see, I include everything under management, is really big. And then the third factor is somehow the soil matters as well. By the way, I'm a guy who only deals with the soil. So I don't deal with the management end, I don't deal with the weather end. So I only deal with the soil. And I want to point out in this whole discussion, I haven't really talked about the soil yet, but I'll get to it in a couple of minutes. Uh, but before I do it, uh, sometimes people ask me, well, how about value of rural land? And I want to point out, uh, I'm not qualified to tell you about value on rural lands. So I know it's kind of uh, bleeds uh, in, in the slide you're looking at right now, but you should ask our extension colleague, Dr. Zhang, he understands how to value land. What I will say is that when people tell me Iowa has uh, some of the highest priced farmland in the uh, world, I always get a little bit worried because this is a photo I took in Costa Rica. These are some uh, vegetable production, uh, highland vegetable production, so we're about 6,000 feet elevation. Uh, you can barely see one of the students' shoulders there. I had a class of 26 students down in Costa Rica in March. We're on 60% slope, so all the work on this land you're seeing in front of you there is done by hand. It's so steep. It's all volcanic ash. Uh, that farmer um, bought that farm about five years ago. It's 15 acres. He spent $2 million for that 15 acres and it didn't have any, anything on it, any improvements. Uh, currently, five miles away, if you buy similar land but you want to have dairy pasture, that's gonna cost you $40,000 uh, an acre for dairy pastures. So when I hear about our more or less $10,000 an acre for farmland in Iowa, that's, a, that's an important price. But I wanna point out, I can take you to places where farmland is much higher valued. I can take you to places where it's much lower valued. I work in Uganda too, much lower value. So the real thing is, I don't know how we value land. I depend on the economists to tell me that. So don't ask me about that. Likewise, even, I can't tell you anything about how to get the best profit from your land. Uh, I want you to be profitable. I want all farmers to be profitable. But that's a very different component. That comes back to how you manage the land as it interacts with the weather. So how you use your soils really affects that. And I have little, uh, I don't have any qualifications of that. What I'm good with, is soil productivity. How does land, how does the soil actually interact such that we get what we want out of it? Get the yield we want, we have um, the productivity we need. By the way, this photo here, in case you're curious, the previous photo where I uh, mentioned about profit, that's from up in Northwest Iowa. I think I took that photo in Dickinson County. Uh, this photo is uh, sugarcane production in Costa Rica on the flatlands. This land is actually worth a lot less, even though it's much flatter and can give you 100 tons uh, per hectare. So uh, more or less 50 tons per acre of sh uh, sugarcane per year. Uh, this land is not near, worth near as much as that highland volcanic ash. But anyway, uh, my specialty is soil productivity. And when I use that term, uh, I want to point out soil productivity just refers to the inherent capability of a soil to support crops. It's what the soil provides. Say a little bit differently, uh, in some ways, soil productivity is analogous to IQ. You know, in school, we get tested for IQ, uh, an intelligence quotient. Who, so to speak, is intelligent, more intelligent than someone else? Soil productivity is not a measure of actual yield. It's not a measure of what actually you get out of your field. Because we all know people who are really intelligent, so would have a really high rating, uh, an IQ, who are lazy. They don't get anything done. Conversely, we know people who, so to speak, have lower IQs, who are actually some of the most wonderfully productive, useful, important people in society. So productivity is this inherent idea. It's not a measure of 
what's, what actually is going to happen. Better way yet to say that is uh, a bad manager with the most productive soil in the world will still have bad management, won't get any yield. A great manager, you give him or her that land, they will get a really good yield even though it's crummy land. So, but my job is soil productivity. And in terms of the history of the science of soil productivity, there have been uh, scientists, there have been agronomists uh, for the last 4,000 years trying to link crop productivity, soils, and rainfall. In China and India, they were doing this uh, thousands of years ago. There are written records of, of how they did it. Quantitative models, so the idea of what a CSR or CSR2 is, this idea that we put a number on it, uh, looking at innate soil productivity, uh, became popular in the 1970s. So there's 50 years of, of really good work where we apply numbers to this. And so today, most nations have one or more. Like I've already mentioned, uh, the United States has the NCCPI, the National Commodity Crop Productivity Index. Uh, certainly, most of the Midwestern states have their own. And in Iowa, we had CSR, and now we have CSR2. Um, and that's just a, a, a quantitative, so it has a number on it, uh, productivity index. And I want to point out the history behind all of these productivity indices is about equitable taxation. So many places in the world, certainly Iowa is one, tax land based on its innate productivity, not its yield. And the reason we do that in Iowa is because of what I just said a minute ago. A bad manager can get no yield off the best land. Where a good manager can get great yields off bad land. Well, if we tax based on your yield, then we're actually taxing based on your management. We're taxing based on your income. That's not how counties get a tax in the state of Iowa. Counties have to tax the resource because the state is going to tax your income. So the counties, which is where CSR, CSR2 apply, the counties need to be able to say, if I have a bad manager who's not getting any yield and I have a, uh, a great manager who's getting a really high yield, what's the tax rate that should apply so they're both taxed based on the actual land? Because income tax will decide who, who pays more based on their income. To say a little bit differently and why this equitable taxation is really important, uh, it's because if we tax based on management, then what we'll do is we will uh, tax people at lower rates who are terrible managers. They will also degrade their soils. They'll ruin the soils for Iowa's future. We won't have higher yields in the future. We'll have lower yields because our soils are ruined. But they'll be taxed lower because they're not getting a yield instead of just destroying their land. Where alternatively, people who are actually doing something useful will be paying more taxes, which makes it tougher for them to keep doing something useful. So the history of productivity comes back to equitable taxation. I know it gets used for lots of other reasons, but I like making that really clear to people. But from a technical point of view, then that gets into how do we predict uh, productivity of soil. And uh, there's lots of ways of going about it, lots of ways people have done it around the world. But traditionally, in Iowa, we very much tied it to geology and weather. We'd say places like that big tongue-shaped uh, part of north central Iowa that uh, covers 20% of the state, the Des Moines lobe, very recent glaciated area, that we would say those soils are somehow more productive than, say, if we went into the Paleozoic Plateau, the pink area in northeast Iowa. Traditionally, we would uh, uh, evaluate productivity around geologic regions and around weather zones. So the Des Moines lobe of north central Iowa, 20% of north central Iowa, we would say that's somehow more productive in general, so better soils, than the Paleozoic Plateau, the pink area of northeast Iowa. Or the deep lust hills would be something different. So we'd have these different zones and we'd say this is where the different productivity zones are. In terms of weather, we would say things like traditionally northwest of Iowa, um, so the light yellow area far northwestern Iowa, its weather is too limiting to have uh, good corn yields and so uh, that has less inherent productivity. So there's all sorts of different ways we would do it with geology and weather, but I'm a proponent that a much better way to do it is simply thinking in terms of what goes on in the root zones. What is those uh, soybean plants, those corn plants, actually experiencing in the root zone? Specifically, uh, how much water will the soil uh, store? And I underline storage because my rule of thumb is um, uh, for every uh, ton of uh, corn we want to harvest, 
then we need about uh, 200 uh, tons of water stored in the soil. So it's more or less uh, 200 to 1 the amount of water that's stored in the root zone over the growing season compared to how much yield we get. So I need a lot of water storage. Uh, but, but that water won't ever get stored if the water can't infiltrate initially. So I need the soil to be such the water infiltrates, it gets stored, and then the excess water drains out. Likewise, uh, the root zone, to really have a good yield, I need uh, a bunch of nutrients there, not just nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, but actually I need the soil to provide 12 nutrients out of the 17 the plant uses. A few things I can get other ways, uh, like from the atmosphere, but for 12 of those nutrients, think calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, those absolutely have to come from the soil, and I need all 12 of those to be available for my plant to really yield. Just as importantly, and maybe even more importantly, I need great gas exchange. You know, all of our roots we're growing, our corn roots, our soybean roots, they only uh, pick up water if that water has a lot of oxygen in it and nutrients. So I not only need that stored water, that available water to be there, and I certainly need it to have a bunch of nutrients dissolved in it, but I also have to have a bunch of oxygen in it, otherwise the roots cannot use it. Because the roots of our crops you do aerobic respiration, um, which means they only respire, they only live, if there's water uh, in the, dissolved in the, in the uh, excuse me, if there's oxygen dissolved in the water. So think of, think of the roots as being like fish. We think of fish living in water. Okay, that's true. But we've all seen fish kills. We've probably all seen someone have like even a guppy tank when, when some uh, child is young. Uh, and if there's no bubbler in that guppy tank, those guppies all die. So we need uh, great gas exchange. My roots only grow where there's a bunch of oxygen in the water. That's how, really what controls how deep they often grow, certainly in Iowa. Uh, I always point out anymore that I think the uh, million, two million miles of tile drainage we have across the state of Iowa, so about 50 linear uh, miles on average per square mile of farmland, uh, all that tile drainage anymore, as we put in more, what it's really doing is uh, generating more and more oxygen deeper in the root zone. So the roots are going deeper where they can pick up more water, more nutrients, and everything is going better. I could also talk about uh, support and anchor, waste disposal, how the soil works as a nursery and symbiosis, but I won't. Really what I want to point out though is uh, a productivity uh, rating of the soil to me needs to take these factors into account. And a uh, soil that has all these factors really running on uh, all eight cylinders works best. By the way, this is also how uh, I think we, sh we should think about limitations in Iowa. And so it helps us explain why that uh, million miles or really two million miles of tile drains anymore. My million miles is about 10 years old anymore. It's probably two million linear miles of tile drains across Iowa. That's simply because we have so many poorly drained soils across the state of Iowa. Uh, in other words, the water table is too shallow. That means there isn't enough oxygen deep in the soil. Uh, for our roots to be happy, uh, we, we put very perforated pipes. So tile in, we drain those soils, and now our poorly drained soils give yield just like they were well-drained soils. In my world, that means an aqua, a poorly drained, nice, black, fertile, productive soil, behaves like it's a udal, a well-drained, nice, black, organic, rich, fertile, highly productive soils. So I can increase my yields. By the way, it's also, even though we, we have these great soils, it's also why over the history of Iowa, we've added uh, billions of tons of fertilizers, manure, ag lime, everything else. We're constantly trying to improve those nutrient availabilities. All 12 of those nutrients we need from the soil, we're trying to improve their availability. Not just the amount there, but balance it out so they're all available when we need them to grow. By the way, of course, another limitation in Iowa that we very much face and, and we very much have to deal with is... Um, our system has also given us the highest rate of cropland erosion in, in the United States. Uh, for the last 80 years, the United States has kept track of what states have the highest corn yields. Uh, on average, you know, Iowa is typically the number one state, as we know, it, throughout the last 80 years. By the way, over that last 80 years, the United States has also kept track of its erosion rates, and we've led the United States in erosion rates from our cropland. So these are, these are how we go about managing the soil, both good and bad. But coming back to it, what I'm really interested in is inherent productivity. But I have, uh, sorry, I have a digression I have to go into. So uh, what I want to point out is all that management I was just describing a minute ago. 
the uh, management for better drainage, the management of better fertility, all those things, all these things we try to get to have higher yields, I want to point out those very management decisions we make over time have big changes in the, cause big changes in the soil. So for example, here uh, what you have on the left is uh, a thin section from zero to 10 centimeters. So the top four inches of uh, a soil core, uh, my group collected in Doolittle Prairie, so just a, a native prairie, someplace that's never been uh, plowed, north of Ames about 10 miles. That on the left is what the soil looks like um, in the top four inches in Doolittle Prairie. On the right is what it looks like under that field. So I would like us all to realize that over time, management is going to change the soil. We're going to keep managing it. We're going to keep managing it more intensely. We're going to keep increasing the yield. But we have changes going on in the soil that often are not what we want. Because the profile, or excuse me, the thin section on the left, see how much white there is? That's the porosity in the soil. That's, that's, that's where it's holding that available water. That's where the gas exchange is going. That's where the roots can work, move. That's what the prairie soil looks like. In the farm field, that's what it looks like. So we, anytime we manage the soil, the experiences with uh, cropping systems, most cropping systems cause porosity to reduce in the soil, which means we're actually storing less available water, which to be honest means we're gonna see more drought problems because we don't have enough water stored as we keep trying to have yields go up. But this is just a slide to remind us that your and my long-term management over time changes the soil and it's not always in ways we want it to. So we should keep track of that. Likewise, uh, I want to restate that. Sometimes it's in really bad ways. A minute ago I mentioned I did that uh, with that compaction, which happens a lot in our fields. Uh, we're at greater risk of drought. So the same amount of rainfall might not give us as much yield as we want. Well, not only are we at more risk of droughts, we're actually at more risk of when it does rain, the water can't infiltrate. That's why when I talk about how, how to rank soils, I start with the idea of water infiltration. Um, because if I compact the soil too much, my water can't infiltrate. And in fact, the slide, the upper left slide is from Pocahontas County about 20 years ago. Uh, it was a drought year. The corn plants you can't see very well are really wilted, are suffering. They had, uh, there was a rain that July day, um, uh, earlier that day when I drove through there. Uh, and what that all is, is the water running out of the field into the ditch because the soil was so compact, it could not infiltrate. So even though the plants were already suffering and it's at a critical time of the year, the water wasn't getting into the soil. The slide on the right is another slide from Dickinson County. I'm not picking on these counties. Uh, rather, I could take these slides in, in any county in Iowa. Uh, but uh, the slide on the right, there's about a 10 foot difference in elevation at the fence line between the field on, your, on the right and the field on the left. That 10 foot difference is because the hill used to go like this. 100 years ago, a fence was put in. On the top side, there's enough erosion that all of the sediment from the field every year after year is building up at about a half inch per year up onto the fence. On the right, it's eroding away at a quarter inch per year low, into a lower area of the field. So if you have 100 years over time, you get a multiple feet differences. So I want to point out, your and my management of the soil is changing it. It can be uh, in really bad ways, in fact. Of course, it can get a lot better, too, as this slide shows. This is from um, over in Iowa County, so in eastern Iowa, uh, uh, from a study I did with a couple of colleagues. Um, one, one was a visiting scholar from Russia, Yuri Chindoff. The other is Tom Sauer at the National Laboratory of Agricultural Environment. So three of us went and looked at um, what the, uh, uh, the soils uh, there, this uh, Fayette soil originally, what it looked like under the natural forest, what it looked like after 50 years of being cropped. So that's the second image. Uh, the third image, going in the lowest image, so to speak, and how I set them up, that image is after 100 years of being cropped. Another one is under an alfalfa field that's been in long-term crop rotations of 150 years. And the two yellow lines show where the top of the soil is versus where the bottom of the A horizon is, the organic-rich zone. Uh, so... The two yellow lines show what it started as, and if you can look close on these slides, you'll see over time, we just keep building the soil A horizon. We build up the infiltration, we build up water storage. So we can make the soils better if we manage right. And actually the last couple of slides, what it really is getting into is other changes we're gonna do into management. 
Just so you know, I anticipate in the next few years here in Iowa, we're going to start sub-irrigating left and right. So instead of having tidal lines just drain the field, we're going to take and put in more sophisticated tidal lines where we can pump water back into the field. That way, we always have enough water in our root zones that our, our genetics is always optimized. We can get the maximum yield possible because we're going to uh, add water when the growing season needs it, but underneath the ground, which is the maximum the optimal way to get it into the roots. That water is not just going to be plain water. We're going to actually, in the growing season, add that water that's really bubbled full of oxygen. Again, my uh, fish tank analogy. We're going to oxygenate the living daylights out of that water because that makes our plants really happy. We're also going to fertigate that water so all the nutrients we need to be added will be being added during the growing season right in the root zone where you get maximum uptake. So we're going to start doing those things in a few years. Some places are already doing it. I know a few farmers in Iowa that are already doing these things. Uh, I know some farmers like in Ohio that are also doing this. Uh, and at the same time, we're going to do some uh, new things with uh, phosphorus fixing mycorrhiza. So we're going to change how phosphorus is picked up in plants by uh, genetically modifying uh, the, roots, the roots and the soil creatures. And we're even going to start introducing new fertilizers. Uh, I've been part of some uh, really fun projects that show if we even add uh, silicon fertilizers on corn on corn on corn, we can increase uh, yield by 10 or 20 percent. And that ultimately gets into the plants become, if it's the right type of silicon fertilizer, the plants are able to pick up water and other nutrients more efficiently. Anyway, uh, I'm pointing out here from a management point of view, there's some really dynamic things that are going to happen. Uh, so management is really changing. And you might say, well, Lee, what's this have to do with soil productivity? A few minutes ago, uh, you just told us that you don't deal with soil uh, management. You only deal with the innate productivity, that actual soil itself. Well, the reason I'm running through all these sorts of uh, things we're doing and how they're going to keep changing in our soils is because I work at Iowa State. I have an educational mission. I need to educate all Iowans that soil is changeable feature. It isn't the same. The soil you started farming with, if you're my age, so you might have started 40 or 50 years ago, uh, the soil you started farming there is not the same soil. Or really, it's the same as I am. Uh, I'm Lee. I've been Lee for 62 years. But I'm not the same guy I was 40 years ago. Your soil on your farm is not the same. It's still the same soil, but it's not. It's a changeable feature. And that means we have to get used to updating soil maps and their interpretations and productivity ratings. So CSR2 is an interpretation from a soil map. So I'm running through all these things about changes because we're going to keep changing the soil. I always a place where we change the soils to get increased yields. But by changing the soil to get increased yield, we change the soil, which changes its inherent features, its inherent productivity. So that's what I deal with. So with that, now I'm ready to talk about CSR and CSR2. CSR, which is what a lot of people call CSR2, I, I'd appreciate it if you would call it CSR2, but, but I understand. Uh, it, it, they sound the same. But CSR, the original CSR, was developed by Tom Fitton, one of the people I acknowledge right up front. Uh, and Dr. Fitton, this is a photo of him standing in a soil pit. Uh, he developed that system in, like I say, in 1971. Uh, and it's brilliant. It's the gold stand standard, even now, it's the gold standard of soil productivity indices in the world. So I'd ask you as an Iowan to be very proud of it. Certainly all of us at Iowa State are very proud of it. If you want to read about CSR, uh, I encourage you to look at Dr. Fitton's publication that he published, uh, as I say, in 1971, um, looking at uh, productivity of, of some Iowa soils. Uh, it's called Spatial Report 66 often. But it's a phenomenal system. And what uh, Dr. Fitton did by putting it together, he was linking the innate productivity, again, how, these, how, how good or bad a given soil is, to how it formed, uh, and then also weather. So he tied it back to this uh, the way the profile looks, that's what's on the left, which, what I call a soil profile, the A, B, C horizons. Uh, and then on the right, it tied into how the different profiles around Iowa looked. Not only did he do that, but he actually linked it across the landscape. So now he'll not only use the profile or the pedon, as I call number one here, he also linked it to the catena, this idea that there are soils and they vary across the landscape, and one soil to the next grades from one to the next, so the productivity changes very gradually. So he did a very good job of connecting it to the catena, what the individual soil is, 
So the Clarion you might be used to, or the Nicolette, or the Webster, or Canisteo. Hey, Harp, Sokoboji, or if you're somewhere else, it might be the Marshall soil, or it might be the Galva soil, or the Kenyan soil, or the Arispe soil, the Clarinda. But he did a very nice job of tying the productivity to a single soil, and then across landscapes. Just did a beautiful job with that. And so as a result, when you look work at Dr. Fenton's original CSR numbers, each one's this nice independent number, but also you can see there's a relationship as you go across the field. It is perfect. He did a beautiful job on it. And the way he did it was he started with a base number of 100, and he said the best soils in Iowa get a productivity of 100. Uh, and then he used um, 11 factors, uh, and he would subtract points off depending on how steep the soil is. The steeper the soil is, the more points he'd take off. Uh, he'd also look at if it's, uh, the long-term history had been eroded. He'd take off points if, if there was uh, long-term recorded erosion at the site. So now, then he uh, also took off points or modified points based on texture. So if you had a really sandy soil, uh, it wasn't as productivity, the profile, as if it was nice and silty or loamy. And then he also corrected for, was it a, a naturally a forested soil or was it naturally a prairie soil? So a variety of things like that. And he also corrected for parent material where you're on the Des Moines Lobe, the Paleozoic Plateau, the Northwest Iowa Till Plain, the Lost Hills. So he, he took these different factors into account and he put together the numbers. So you might say though, then Lee, why'd you do CSR2? Uh, if the gold standard is CSR, why not just keep, with, keep it? And the short answer is, man, I wanted to. I wanted to keep CSR, I didn't want to touch this. Because did I mention early on that CSR and CSR2 are both about taxation? I'm a professor at Iowa State. I don't ever want to talk about land taxes. I don't want to talk, deal with taxes. That's something I want accountants dealing with, not me. So why CSR2? Well, the short answer is CSR2 and CSR are both required by the state of Iowa. So Dr. Fenton in 1971 put together that original productivity rating to meet a state mandate that the legislature said had to happen and basically said, Tom Fenton has to do it. And since I replaced Tom Fenton, it became Lee Burris had to do CSR2. So, but uh, CSR2, it's three goals from a technical goal. It's to have values that are consistent with today's soil mapping, classification, and government programs. So I want to start with soil mapping. So when Dr. Fenton did CSR, each county had its own book. Most of you, many of you are familiar with the, the old county soil surveys. And so, and one county to the next, they might not be surveyed adjacent counties for 20 years. There might be a 20 year gap between when Humboldt County was surveyed and Wright County was surveyed, adjacent counties. So Dr. Finn was tweaking CSR every year. And so those two counties, even though they both have like clarion soil, they can have very different, not very different, but five points difference in what the CSR values were. Well, today's soil map is Web Soil Survey. It's linked across, not just across Iowa, but across the whole United States. So NRCS will not let a productivity rating be put into their map system if it changes suddenly at county lines for no good reason. There has to be a technical soil reason for why they change. So since I took over this job when Web Soil Survey was coming in, that suddenly became a huge problem if we want CSR values to be available. They somehow had to be made consistent because the maps made it have to, ha have to happen, the modern mapping. But that then led into how Dr. Fenton's system worked. I said he worked with these different properties of soils like parent material. Well, we've redefined some of the parent materials. We've identified new types of parent materials, new geology of soils. We have new horizons. We have changed the classification system of soils compared to when Dr. Fenton did it. In 1971, we used a classification system that might have something like um, Brunizims in it, or planisols. These would be technical terms. That classification system for the United States soils was updated in 1975. So where now this idea of a Brunizim would be a molosol, the idea of a, uh, a planisol would actually be an RG all ball. And Dr. Fenton's system said, if you have a planisol Lee, you have to take off 20 points because it's planisol. I don't have planisols anymore. I have RG all balls. So I need to update to meet the classification system. And to say it a little bit differently, no one can go into court. So in my case, I might have to go into court to explain what's going on. Uh, a productivity rating that changes for no clear reason at a county line. And that changes that I'm using, or, or worse yet, that I'm using 50-year-old soil classification terms, even though it's a modern productivity rating. 
So the soil mapping and classification meant I needed a new system. And then all these systems, either one has to tie into government programs. And so there's a whole series of government programs that use, so I'm talking USDA programs, that use these productivity ratings. They cannot change at county lines. They have to be consistent for those government programs. So the technical goal with CSR2, what I started with was, I need to make sure I developed a system that worked for modern soil mapping, modern classification, and fit all the government programs that are mandated to use it. By the way, you as a private landowner don't have to use it at all. You as a farmer, you can use whatever you want. Private companies can use whatever they want. The government can't. They have to use what's consistent with state code, and in some cases, national code. So that gets a little different. By the way, my philosophical goal in terms of uh, CSR2 was to have proportional values to CSR. CSR was the gold standard. I wanted to keep it the same. But I say proportional values because I couldn't keep the values exactly the same because otherwise these county breaks would still exist. They had to go away. But I also wanted greater transparency, consistency, and ease. Because I mentioned Dr. Fitton's 23-page uh, document that explained how CSR worked. I've met two people besides me that I actually trust have read it. And one of them is Dr. Fitton. <laughs> okay, counting Dr. Fitton. Four people. Dr. Miller, Fitton, Dr. Miller, those two. And then I met two other people that have done it besides me that's read it. It's not easy to read. It's not easy to follow. It's really complicated to get numbers. And that comes back to government programs. Actually, the way I really got into CSR2 was uh, NRCS for one of their uh, management programs in southern Iowa were telling a farmer, uh, a landowner, that he could only apply manure at the rate of a CSR value of five because that's what that particular soil had. And that basically meant he could not apply manure. And he said, that's not right. Show me how you got that number. And NRCS could not calculate it because all their soil scientists are too young to use the old classification system. So then the state soil scientist called me up and said, Lee, uh, we have a problem. A farmer wants this explained, and we can't explain it in NRCS. Oh, and it's an ISU number. You explain it. And that's where it's like, okay, well, I can't use a 50-year-old classification system and justify it. I have to update it. So this comes back to greater transparency. These numbers have to be transparent. Everyone has to be able to get the same number. It doesn't have to be a number that only Lee can calculate or only one other person in the country can calculate. It needs to be a number that anyone can get. So it needs to be transparent. It needs to be consistent across the whole state. And it needs to be easy. It's about taxes. Let's keep the system easy. Let's make sure people can follow what's going on and they understand it. They may not agree with it. That's okay. That's different. But we should all be able to get the same number and see how it's gotten and agree that that's a straightforward way of doing it. Uh, by the way, the third goal then on all this, obviously, was to get CSR2 to extend across boundaries. And I say it that way uh, because this is a system that now can be applied a lot of places, not just to Iowa. And so actually I can apply and have to that uh, soybean field on the left, which is in China. I can apply it, uh, as I said, to China. That's where the middle slide is. Dr. Fitton's um, the farthest right person. Rick Cruz, some of you may know him. He's, he's the second to the right person. Uh, and then I'm standing there uh, learning about productivity on soils that are very similar to Iowa, but corn and soybean productivity in northwest, uh, northeast uh, China. And I can also apply it in places like Ecuador, which is where the other photo is. But it's a way to get it to extend across boundaries, not just county boundaries, but lots of places. But really, it's ultimately to get the same numbers as CSR, at least similar numbers, uh, but that meet and will continue to be continually updated systems that occur through modern soil mapping and such. So how are CSR2s calculated? Well, very similar to how Dr. Fenton calculated them. Uh, I just use six parameters, though. And, uh, but the best soil still gets 100 points. Uh, and so it's six straightforward parameters. These are them. The first thing I work with is what's known as a taxonomic subgroup. And I'm smiling a little bit because people love taxonomic subgroups. That's where I might say, well, I'm interested in, is it a typic haplodol or is it a uh, intic endoaqual? Boom. It doesn't make any sense. But for people like me or Dr. Finn or people who actually work with soil profiles, I have just communicated about 25 different properties of that soil that will tell people is it a good soil or a bad soil really fast. So it uses a technical term. It starts with S. And the best typic subgroups, taxonomic subgroups, like a typic haplodol, get 100 points. Um, so it works really, really well. It's a way... Um, that goes fast. And by the way, where did I get that 100 points for a typical haplodol? I looked at Dr. Fenton's soils, and I looked at which soils had 100 under his system, and I looked up the taxonomic subgroup for them and tied them together. 
Uh, M is the family particle size class. So that is the soil, is it sandy? Which in case we might take off 20 points. Is it silty? So really nice, typically lust derived soil, but really silty, great available water holding capacity, water movement, easy root growth. No points get taken off. So loamy, those sorts of things. Field conditions, and the SMU stands for soil map unit. By field conditions, this is just tying back to what Dr. Finn did. Is it a steep soil, B slope, C slope, D slope, F slope, whatever? Or is it a soil that floods or ponds? Does water stand on it during the growing season? So this takes off points for, for ponding and flooding and such. W is the water holding capacity. It takes a heck of a lot of water stored in the soil to get the corn yields we want now, the soybean yields we want now. This takes how many, how many tons of water can we store per acre, if you will. That's what the whole water holding capacity. And then the D factor is the soil depth and erosion factor. Um, so is this a soil that if we beat on it for 20 years, will it still have high yields? Or is this one of those soils that we beat on it for five years, it all falls apart? Some soils are more resilient than others. And then the expert judgment term, the sixth term, which is a plus and minus, it just is a correction factor. Uh, and people often think, well, Lee, this is just so you can do whatever you want. Uh, it's not. Uh, I'm going to come back to it in a minute, but it's, uh, it's simply tied into a few soils of Iowa where Dr. Fenton had a very specific reason to, to change the ratings in the original um, CSR. And so with expert judgment, what I've done is I, ha I use those same reasons, but I call it expert judgment because it's a specific reason that the other ter terms can't cover. Uh, and then I define that in the documents you can look up that have all these numbers in them. So coming back to it, the formula is ISUs. This is entirely ISU. I, uh, I developed it. I had uh, one of my graduate students work with me on it, and then I have uh, have other people help me out at times with it. But ultimately, it was my responsibility to develop this. So it's ISU's number. But even though it's an ISU's number, NRCS decisions affect it. So to say a little bit differently, uh, there's 10,000 soil map units in Iowa uh, in 2009. Today, well, actually a couple months ago when I updated uh, CSR 2 for NRCS and their yields for the NRCS's uh, field technical guides, NRCS now recognizes 13,000 soil map units. This idea of web soil survey, there's constant updates to web soil survey NRCS is doing. I don't have any influence on them, but when they do that, they modify what a soil map unit is. So now they call parts of Iowa's clarion soils 138. Other parts, they call it L138. Well, that's a different map unit. CSR2 has to tie into those things. So I anticipate by the time I retire in 10 years, there'll be 16,000 soil map units in Iowa. It has to tie into that soil map because a productivity rating only works if there's a map to go with it. So I have to be able to tie this ISU number into what NRCS does. And they work on national policies, not state policies, so I can't control what's going on. To, to restate this, CSR2, I'm going to say this probably two or three more times, is ISUs. But NRCS controls the official soil map of Iowa. That's Web Soil Survey. And I say it's official because it's what the state of Iowa Revenue Department says county assessors must use in order to tax your land. So CSR2 ties into the soil map, and the soil map with CSR2 is used by the county assessors. And that's how the state of Iowa law is set up. So I just can influence the formula, not the rest. The formula then ties into NRCS data systems, and those data systems cause the number to outcome. So I get to modify how the formula works, but not how it's ultimately used. So there's a series of things going on because of uh, legally what has to happen. So now coming back to expert judgment, uh, it's the thing I get, uh, so to speak, uh, most flack or, or teased about or both or whatever. Um, it sounds like I can do whatever I want. Really, this is the list for the whole state of Iowa, the expert judgment. Um, it affects about 40 of Iowa soils. And what this says is for paleosol soils, which is a term Dr. Fenton could use because it was a, a parent material, for paleosol soils, we typically take off more points because they're, they're not only high clay, they're really dense clay. But the trouble is I can't just say I'll take off points for paleosols because NRCS doesn't necessarily call them paleosols. They might call them old till or just plain till. Well, till is, a, is actually the parent material for clarion soil. It's not a paleosol. So the terminology is inconsistent in the NRCS database. So I just say for these soils, they're actually paleosols. We take off these points. These soils are unusually sandy for some unique purpose. So we can't just say they're sand. There's something unique about them. 
we, we take off points, but all these things are to be consistent with Dr. Fitton's original ratings. Because in my opinion, it was the gold standard. It is the gold standard. It's really nice. So th that's what these correction factors. You can see this is a, actually a photograph, so to speak, a, a photocopy of an image of a table I put together. These tables of numbers are all available. Every, every factor I mentioned has a set of numbers associated for each one. They're available through an ISU publication. So you're welcome to, to see what all the numbers are. You're welcome to calculate your own factor. But as I say, the data from CSR2 is not from ISU. It's from Web Soil Survey. So I publish how to use data. I don't publish the map. And so what that means then is if you look at the formula, the CSR2 formula, and you look at the Fayette soil on B slope, a very common soil, about a million acres of Iowa, uh, have this, well, a million acres are Fayette, uh, 400,000 of them are in B slope. So about a county's worth, 1% of Iowa is this, this nice Fayette soil, beautiful soil. If you run through the points, look up what typical haplodalph is worth, a fine silt is worth, B slope, uh, amount of available water, all those sorts of things, you'll find that has ISU numbers, the way my, my formula works, so to speak, would be 84 points. That'd be the CSR2 value. If you actually look what's on a, available on Web Soil Survey, you're likely going to find the numbers 85. And the reason the ISU number and NRCS's calculation is different is Web Soil Survey takes into account what other soils are mapped. So the 15 acres of Fayette soil that's sort of in the center of this map on B slope, that 15 acres, actually, the NRCS will tell you, yeah, but 5% of it is an inclusion of TAMA. TAMA has a CSR2 value of 100. It has a CSR value of 100 as well. So it's a perfect soil, but since a little bit of that Fayette is TAMA, the weighted average pops up for that map unit, that area of soil. Some other place, it might be uh, fair on a C slope, might be 20% Clorinda. Clorinda has uh, a CSR2 value or a CSR value of like 20. That's going to pull the points down. So this is a weighted average system that, so NRCS's numbers, which are the official numbers, tie into what the whole field has, not just how to calculate the simple number. It's a weighted average. So how does CSR2 compare to CSR? Well, this is from Washington County in eastern Iowa. So uh, on average, uh, they're 90% the same. There's a little bit of variability, and there's one real outlier. But overall, for those 125 different soil map units uh, in Washington County, when, when uh, we updated I updated it, they came out very similar. So something like the Mahaska soil, and the original CSR was a 95, and the CSR2, it's a 94. So I tried to show some that worked well and some that didn't work as well here. But these would just be the examples of some of the main soils of Washington County. It worked really well, though. For Cass County, um, it works really well as well. You can't really see the formula, but, but the difference is this has like a 0.87 or something, or 0.8, so 80% successful or so in doing it. Uh, the really interesting thing here is you'll notice the equation is CSR2 is equal to 1.09. So there's a 9% increase is what that's saying. The CSR2 value on average is about 9% higher than the CSR value. You might say, Willie, that shouldn't have happened, should it? And yeah, it should. It was intentional. The reason it happened is because this map comes back to the original CSR, and in places like Cass County, Dr. Fenton took off six points for any given soil in Cass County because it was thought to be limiting for corn production because it was drier, not as much rain. By the time you get to Lyon County, far northwest Iowa, Dr. Fenton's original CSR took off 18 points for the same soil as you might find in eastern Iowa. Say so a little bit differently, the, uh, these are all numbers that are hard for you to see probably, but for just the colo soil, colo is mapped in 77 different counties of Iowa. What you'll find is there is uh, over a 10-point difference from one county to the next in Colo, or excuse me, across the state. And that 10-point difference really reflected Dr. Fitton's uh, assessment that the Colo soil, as you went to northwest Iowa, became more and more limiting for corn production because of weather limitations. So this was a climate term. Well, I got rid of that climate term. Uh, I got rid of it for Cass County. I got rid of it for Lyon County. And I got rid of it uh, in consultation with Dr. Fitton, with Dr. consultation with Dr. Miller, the originators of CSR. I got rid of it simply because um, uh, Northwest Iowa doesn't have weather limitation anymore for growing corn. I don't know if it's because of improved genetics, better farming, better weather. I don't know. 
It's all those things maybe, probably. But the bottom line is Northwest Iowa now normally has the most productive area, highest yields in the state. The CSR2 values can reach 100 up there, which those soils deserve. From a root zone point of view, those are perfect soils in, in some places in Northwest Iowa. So coming back to it in the next couple of minutes, how best should you use CSR or CSR2? They're meant for equitable taxation. Furthermore, they assume equally good management by everyone, and they use only soil survey data. So they're really powerful under those conditions. They do let us compare two soils fairly in an equitable way. But they also assume this good management. And what I want to point out with my second bullet point there is, so they don't take into account the specific management that can make or break a farm. As I already mentioned, yield really depends on all sorts of management. Over long term, good management improves your soil. Over long term, bad management destroys your soil. So CSR and CSR2 intentionally do not look at that. They say, we're going to assume everyone's a good manager doing the right thing. They're adding tile lines when they need to. They're reducing erosion when they need to. They add fertilizers. So I would not use CSR and CSR2 at that level of specificity. To say it a little bit differently, if I was in the private sector, I'd use it as a starting number for valuing my land, but I'd not use it as the only number. I'd want to know yield histories for the last 40 years. I'd want to know fertilizer history for the last 40 years, and I want to know drainage histories because those are the long-term management differences that make a huge difference. To say it a little bit differently, if I buy a house, I want to know what the last owner used and probably the owner before that used in that house. I don't want just the original floor plan. That's how to use CSR and CSR2. So equally importantly, and the reason I'm here, is ISU has an educational responsibility. Soils are not static. As a result, our maps and interpretations are not static. They're continuing to change. Now, uh, specifically right now, in 2022, uh, my biggest challenge as I work with CSR2 is are the soils that flood, pond, and some of them that have really high clay. Those are causing me lots of big problems in terms of getting the CSR2 right. But that's beyond today's discussion. Uh, with that, I just want to uh, thank you very much for having listened. Uh, I really enjoyed um, doing this. Um, and I very much want to thank you for uh, being part of Crops TV. Uh, and keep learning. I wish you the best. Bye-bye.